All right. So this is the PowerPoint that I just uploaded this morning. It's an exercise nine module. And it basically is a, the one I use for lecture out of our lecture book. You see our lecture book up here. And I just shortened it just to include some of the important information that is covered uh, for this section for lab. All right. Um, so let's just jump into it. Uh, the gross anatomy of the urinary system is fairly simple. Uh, and what I mean to say by that is all of the structures and organs are fairly simple. Everybody knows you have two kidneys. You might not know the name of the, of the tubes that carry urine from the kidneys, but those are called the ureters. You have two of those, one for each kidney. We have a temporary storage site for urine. It's called our urinary bladder. Obviously, you know that. And then the final common tube that allows urine to exit the body is called the urethra. The urinary system is involved in maintaining homeostasis of pretty much everything about the blood and really all fluids in the body. So we're going to cover, cover uh, some of that and how it's achieved. I did leave some of these animations in, the in here for you that normally is for lecture. If you want to review them when you get home, you can. You have to be connected to the internet in order to access them. But um, here's the, the uh, schematic of diagram of the urinary system, two kidneys, obviously, the ureters, which lead from the kidney down to the urinary bladder, which is a temporary storage site for urine. And then the urethra is that final tube, that final uh, tube that allows urine to exit the body. Now, what's interesting about the kidneys, <clears throat> which you may or may not know, but I know you can read it in one of those paragraphs in the Engage Manual. They don't really show it here, but your kidneys lie behind all of the other organs in the peritoneal cavity. So in, in your abdominal cavity. So, you know, you have your stomach in there and your liver and you have your small intestine, large, intestine. you know, all the organs that are in your abdominal cavity, your kidneys lie behind the organs behind a tissue membrane, which is actually behind the cavity. So your kidneys are not exposed <clears throat> to the inside of what's called the peritoneal cavity, where your stomach and your intestine and, and your liver is located. It actually lies behind a, a membrane that's separated from the other organs. And so since it's lying behind that membrane, we say that the kidneys lie retroperitoneal. So the word retroperitoneal just simply means behind the peritoneal cavity. That's what that means. So they don't really show it, but the kidneys are isolated into their own little cavity behind the peritoneal space. So here <clears throat> I just put some of the brief functions of the kidney. And I'll just say this again, the kidney regulates everything about the blood, all aspects of the blood pretty much. It regulates the composition of all your electrolytes, your ionic compounds. I put a few here that you recognize, sodium, potassium, so forth. Um, your kidneys are one of two organs that regulates blood pH at the organ level. So we're gonna dive into that a little bit more next week. But our blood pH is regulated on several different levels. And we say blood pH is regulated at the organ level because we have the kidneys and the lungs, which can regulate the blood pH based on the organ function and not just because of some buffers that are in the blood and whatnot that we'll cover. So the kidneys regulate our, our blood pH by altering the level or concentration of acid, which is hydrogen ion, and bicarbonate in the blood, which is, this is our, one of the main buffers in the blood that we're gonna talk about next week. It's not the only one, but the kidneys regulate how much of these are in the blood and how much we excrete in urine. I'm actually gonna show you the transporters that are involved in doing that at the end of this packet. <clears throat> so um, obviously the kidneys regulate your blood volume by either conserving water or eliminating water. Now, if your kidneys are dumping more water out, your urinary output volume would go up, right? Obviously, you're urinating more out, urinating more water out. But where does that water really come from that we urinate out? 
It comes from plasma. When we filter the blood in the kidney, we're filtering out water and a whole bunch of other stuff that I'm going to mention in a little bit. And so if the kidney doesn't reabsorb the water, it filters out, it's going to excrete it in urine. So if your kidneys are uh, being directed by some of the homeostatic feedback mechanisms to excrete more water out, then your urinary output volume would go up, but your blood volume would go down. And if your blood volume goes down, your blood pressure goes down. So for that reason, for that's one of several reasons on how the kidney regulates our blood pressure because it regulates water volume in the blood. On the other hand, if the kidney decreases the amount of water that it's excreting out in urine, your urinary output volume would go down and your blood volume would go up. In which case your blood pressure can come up. I mean, just think about it. If, if someone comes to the ER and they're severely dehydrated, their kidneys are probably not excreting much water out in their urine. And on the other hand, they're coming to the, the ER, the doctor, wherever they're going. The first thing that the clinician is going to do is hang an IV bag on them to re-infiltrate water because, well, they're dehydrated. And it's not just water, it's electrolytes as well that they get. But I think you get the point. So but the kidneys regulate how much water remains in the blood. We can excrete more out in urine or we can save more. And that has an effect on blood pressure. Now, the kidneys regulate blood pressure in other ways by activating a hormonal system that you might remember reading about. You remember the renin angiotensin aldosterone system? I think we covered that back in the endocrine chapter. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you in this chapter what cell types produce renin. And we're gonna have to know that in fact. So before we get to all of that physiology, let's cover some of the anatomy of the kidney and then go over its parts and then what the blood flow through the kidney is. So the kidney obviously shaped like a kidney bean. That's kind of why we call a kidney bean a kidney bean, right? So it's kind of shaped like a kidney bean. It is surrounded by a dense connective tissue capsule, which is called the renal capsule. Just deep to the capsule, where you see at least in the picture here, this lighter tissue, that's called the renal cortex, the outer part of the kidney. The darker areas in the middle of the kidney, along with these little lighter tissue areas between those dark triangular pyramid looking structures. These are called the renal columns and the little pyramid looking things, the upside down pyramid is called a renal pyramid. So the renal pyramids, the darker spots and the columns in the middle of the kidney, that's all called the renal medulla, right? At the tip of each one of these renal pyramids, where it comes to a point, that's called the renal papilla. So you can see all these names over here, right? Um, you're going to be identifying these things on the models. Make sure you go and review my Quizlets. They're all labeled in there. And you'll see uh, some of these models and other models on your pre and post lab assignments as well. But the tip of a pyramid is called the renal papilla. All right. Now, we have in this picture, this little yellow squiggly line. You can barely see it, it's kind of small, but this is called a nephron. The nephron is the functional unit in the kidney. This is what performs all three processes that are required for the production of urine and thus the maintenance of all of the composition of our blood and other bodily fluids. So, this nephron is composed of two principal parts that can be broken down into subparts, which we'll do in a second. And there are a million of these in each kidney, by the way, a million nephrons in each kidney. Now, as far as urine flow, this structure, the nephron has the job of filtering the blood. It actually filters the blood at that little circle that you see right there. I know we can't barely see it, but that's where the filter's at. So the blood's being filtered there 
and that filtration product that is coming out of the filter mill membrane, that filtration product of plasma is called filtrate. So filtrate flows through this tube, the squiggly tube until it gets to the end. The filtrate as it moves through this tube is going to be changed chemically because on its path through that tube, the cells that line the tube have the job of reabsorbing any good substances that got filtered out and putting them back into the blood. So basically at the filter, when we filter the blood, we don't just filter our waste products out. You filter everything out except for red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, and large plasma proteins. Now your waste products come out, various ions, small vitamins, amino acids, um, all sorts of things are coming out. Sugar, glucose, we have to talk about, right? Um, and then water. So all that stuff is being filtered out. Of course, we don't wanna lose all of that in urine. So what we have to do is reclaim all of the good substances that are flowing through the tube and put them back in the blood vessel that surrounds the tube that they don't show here. So by the time we get all of that completed, the fluid that is dripping out the end of this tube, which is called a papillary duct down here, it drains out the tip of a pyramid called the renal papilla into this little space. This little space is called the minor calyx. So by the time the filtrate has been chemically modified on its path through this tube and it's dripping out the end of a papillary duct into the minor calyx, we call it urine at that point because we're not changing the chemical composition of it anymore. So the flow of urine would go from the papillary duct in an renal papilla into the minor calyx. So you have a minor calyx at the tip of each renal pyramid. So these have been cut open so we can see it's a hollow space. These are still closed and you kind of see it looks like a little tube at the tip of the renal pyramid. So at the renal papilla. So where we have multiple minor calyces joining together, it's called a major calyx. So the minor calyx is right at the tip of a pyramid at the renal papilla. The major calyx is where several of them are draining urine into a larger space that's called a major calyx. And the largest opening just inside what we call the hillus of the kidney. This indented area of the kidney is called the hillus. Just inside the hillus, this larger opening is called the renal pelvis. So urine is gonna flow from the minor calyx into a major calyx into the renal pelvis and from the renal pelvis into this tube, the ureter. The ureter has the job of carrying the urine down to the urinary bladder where it's stored until you go to the bathroom. So that's really, we're gonna be talking about how we manipulate the filtrate as it moves through this tube, at least with some of the substances. Not, we're not covering every single substance, but some of them. And so you're also going to have to know the path that urine is taking out of the kidney down to the bladder. That's why I covered that. And you're going to have to be able to identify the renal pyramid, the renal papilla, the minor calyx, a major calyx, the renal pelvis, you know, things like that. <clears throat> and then we're also going to have to identify the blood vessels all through the kidney, which we're about to cover. And you're going to have to know the parts of a nephron. I got to teach you that. Now, the reason why we're going to learn the blood flow through the kidney <clears throat> is because blood flow is what directly drives kidney function. So if the blood flow is, is inhibited or altered, if, if the blood pressure is too high or too low, it can alter kidney function. If it's way too high, the kidney can get damaged. That's why severe hypertension, uncontrolled hypertension can lead to renal hypertension and kidney failure. Um, if the blood pressure is too low, 
then and the, if something's wrong with the kidney, at least then the kidney may malfunction. But ultimately, what's interesting about the kidney is that it is a very special organ with regards to having the ability to regulate its own blood pressure. So if your blood pressure in your body, the systemic pressure went up too high, the kidney can bring its own pressure back down a little bit. If the blood pressure in the body went down too low, the kidney can increase its pressure a little bit. It's called autoregulation. Very interesting how the kidney does that and three major processes involved in that. But nonetheless, let's go through the blood flow through the kidney. So the arterial flow is ultimately going to come from the aorta, which is not here, the abdominal aorta. And we have our renal artery coming off the abdominal aorta, if you remember that from the blood vessel chapter. The renal artery will perforate the kidney going into the hilus of the kidney. And as soon as the renal artery enters the kidney, it, it divides into what we call segmental arteries. So these little branches right after the renal artery enters the kidney are called segmental arteries. The segmental arteries then branch, have branches that go up the renal columns. So the little red vessel that you would see along the side of a pyramid in a renal column is called an interlobar artery. So if there was a pointer on a model or a picture or anything, if it's pointing to a red vessel and it's in this column, it can only be one thing. It can only be the interlobar artery, right? If it's a red vessel out here and it's not the whole renal artery, it's got to be a segmental because it goes renal, segmental, interlobar, right? And here they have it in a flow chart. You can look at it later, which I'm going to point to name over there anyway in a minute. But now these interlobar arteries are coursing up the column going towards the cortex. They then give rise to a branch, an arterial branch that courses over the top of each of the renal pyramids. The vessel that arches over the top of a renal pyramid, the artery, is called an arcuate artery. Right here, arcuate artery. So the interlobar supplies blood up into the arcuate artery because the blood's coming in this way, renal artery, segmental artery, interlobar, arcuate. Now from the arcuate artery, if you notice, and I know the picture is kind of small, but they have these little bitty red blood vessels that go perpendicular up through the cortex. The only red vessel that goes up through the cortex like that is called the cortical radiate artery. I mean, I'm circling the vein, the cortical radiate artery. It's the same name, but it's an artery for the red one. Wherever they have it labeled. Oh, up here, cortical radiate artery. So the red vessel up in the cortex is the cortical radiate artery. Now, from the cortical radiate artery, we have a branch of a small artery, which you remember is called an arteriole. We have the most important arteriole in the kidney that branches directly off of the cortical radiate artery. It's called the afferent arteriole, which is this one. So the afferent arteriole is the only branch off of the cortical radiate artery. The reason why I'm telling you that is because when you're identifying these things on models, some students reverse the afferent and the efferent arteriole. And you'll see uh, where it connects, uh, or I'll point it out in a minute, but the afferent arteriole is the, is the one that branches off the cortical radiate. Now, the reason why this one's important is for several reasons. I'll, I'll cover one of them now. This little arter, arteriole is supplying blood into the filter. Here's the filter in the kidney. This little circular structure is called a renal corpuscle in, of the nephron. 
Inside that renal corpuscle is a group of capillaries called the glomerulus. The glomerulus is the filter in the kidney. This is where we're filtering all of our blood. So this whole thing is the nephron right here. That was this little yellow thing that we couldn't barely see here. It's enlarged a little bit here, not really much enlarged, but it's a little bit bigger. We're gonna see even a bigger picture of it in a minute. But this whole thing is the nephron with the blood supply coming to it. So the nephron is composed of this renal corpuscle and then this squiggly tube everywhere that we're gonna identify. The filter is this glomerular capillary bed. So the blood comes in the afferent arteriole, the high blood pressure in there forces fluid and solutes out into a little space. And that fluid that is forced out of the blood is called filtrate. That filtrate then moves in one direction through what's called the renal tubule. That's the rest of the nephron. Now, as the blood is being filtered in the glomerulus, it's also exiting the renal corpuscle and glomerulus via the efferent arteriole right there. The efferent arteriole supplies blood into one of two capillary beds. There's a capillary bed that's up towards the cortex around the renal tubule in the cortex. That's called the peritubular capillary network. But it also supplies blood down into a capillary bed that's in the medulla, in the renal pyramid, around the renal tubule in the pyramid is called the vasa recta. So blood's gonna go from the cortical radiate artery here in the cortex and supply blood into the afferent arteriole, which sends it to the glomerulus so we can filter the blood and form the filtrate. The blood then is going to leave via the efferent arteriole and flow into the peritubular capillary network out in the cortex and the vasa recta down in the renal medulla. The blood then leaves those capillary networks and is drained into the cortical radiate vein, which is the only the biggest blue vessel that goes perpendicular up through the cortex. That's called the cortical radiate vein. So the veins and the arteries all have the same name. All we do is change artery or vein after it. So now after we filter the blood and the blood went through the capillary networks, we're about to drain the blood back out of the kidney. So we do that by collecting the blood from these capillary networks into the cortical radiate vein. From the cortical radiate vein, the blood goes into the arcuate vein, which are the blue vessels that course over the top of a renal pyramid. So all the blood in the cortex is being collected down through a cortical radiate vein, going to the arcuate vein, which then sends the, the blood down through the renal column in the interlobar vein, which then sends the blood on its way out of the kidney via the segmental veins and then the renal vein. And from here, the blood's going to be dumped into the inferior vena cava, but they don't show it. So we need to know the blood flow through the kidney, and you're going to be identifying these various blood vessels on models. So I had them all labeled in the Quizlet, so you need to make sure you review that. Um, here's another animation you can view at home uh, on uh, nephron, basic nephron physiology, which we're about to cover, and the anatomy of the nephron, another little review animation. Um, but before I move forward, let's go over the nephron since this is a little bit bigger right here, and I can show you the parts of it. So the nephron is made of two main things. Something the, the round structure is called the renal corpuscle. The renal corpuscle. The squiggly tube everywhere is called the renal tubule. But the renal tubule has specific names for different parts of it that you have to learn how to identify. So let me explain to you how you're going to remember which part is which. When the blood is being filtered 
at the glomerulus. The filtrate is flowing into what's called the capsular space that then flows into this tube. As the filtrate flows into this tube, it only flows in one direction. So if you learn the parts of the renal tubule in order that, that I'm about to tell you, and you, when you go to try and identify it, always start with the part of the tube that's connected to the renal corpuscle, you'll never get it wrong. And you might think, well, how would I ever get that wrong? It's all in a straight line. Because someone on some of the models, this is flipped around. And the parts that people typically mess up are the limbs of this loop. They reverse them. You can't just say, okay, the descending parts on the right and the ascending parts on the left. You can't do that. Because in some of the pictures and models, this is flipped around because the nephron is flipped over. So let's go over it. The first part of the renal tubule is referred to as the proximal convoluted tubule. It's called proximal because it is proximal to the renal corpuscle. It's called convoluted because it's really all twisted up in the kidney. It twists back on itself. Proximal convoluted tubule can be abbreviated PCT. P as in Paul, PCT. So then the filtrate is going to flow down what's called the nephron loop. An older name for that is called the Loop of Henley. And you'll probably still see that name. So we have two arms to this loop. One of the arms, which are called limbs, is called the descending limb of the nephron loop because the filtrate goes down. And the other one is called the ascending limb of the nephron loop because the filtrate goes up. So on the practical, we're going to have to clarify this a little bit. I'm going to show you on a much bigger picture, but for now we have a descending and an ascending limb. After this ascending limb, the last part of the renal tubule is called the distal convoluted tubule because it's farther away from the renal corpuscle. So let's look at the renal corpuscle a little bit closer. I have this slide in here twice. I don't know why, but anyway, here's a large view of the renal corpuscle. We actually have a model that looks just like this. And it's in Quizlet. Um, the coloration of these little cells on the outside of the capillaries are different. I think they're, they're more white. But nonetheless, you have a model that looks just like this. So what are we looking at here? Well, we're looking at what is called the renal corpuscle, but also part of the renal tubule. So let me just go down and show you what we're looking at. This is the most important arteriole in the kidney. This is the afferent arteriole, the afferent. It's called afferent because it brings blood towards the glomerular capillaries, which are housed. So this is all the glomerulus and it's all housed inside of this little bowl, capsule. This little capsule has a couple of names. It's called Bowman's capsule or the glomerular capsule. So these little cells, so it's lying inside this capsule and there's a space in there. The space in there is called the capsular space. These strange looking cells right here on top of the capillary loops, these are called podocytes. The podocytes, form what's called the visceral layer of the glomerular capsule. We have a parietal layer. It's formed by simple squamous cells on the inside of the capsule. And we have a visceral layer, which is formed by these podocytes. And in between the two layers is that space called the capsular space. The other thing that these podocytes are doing for us is that they are forming the outermost layer of the filtration membrane. There's three layers to this filtration membrane. We're not covering them in here. You're gonna do that in the lecture. But the outermost layer is in between these little bitty foot plate extensions. See the little spines that come off the cell, little membrane extensions? Those are called pedicles. And in between the pedicle is, a, is what's called a slit membrane. And so that's the last part of the filter. 
So the blood pressure inside the glomerulus is pretty high. It's higher than any other capillary bed in the body because it's specialized for a few reasons. One, the capillary loops are really, really, really long in a small confined space. And we learn in or in your lecture, if, you, if your teacher covered it, when you cover resistance, if blood is in a longer vessel, it meets more resistance, which increases pressure. So it's kind of that little thing going on there. So we have very long capillary loops. We also have this, the entry point of blood coming into the glomerulus is larger in diameter than the exit point of blood leaving the glomerulus. So we, we always have a larger volume of blood coming in, adding pressure in here, then leaving over time. Of course, that can change. It doesn't stay the same, in fact, ever. Changes all the time. The size of these vessels and the volume of blood that gets in here, and thus it changes blood pressure. The blood pressure is what directly drives filtration. So we can alter the blood pressure in this capillary bed by altering the size of this afferent arteriole and or the size of the efferent arteriole. So this is the afferent arteriole, this is efferent. Now, how are you on the test gonna know which one is afferent and which one is efferent if we don't see if that the afferent is connected to that cortical radiate artery? Well, you're gonna know which one is which because of these special cells in the wall of the afferent arteriole. You see right there how the, the smooth muscle cells are a little bit larger. They're larger smooth muscle cells, specialized smooth muscle cells in the wall. Those cells are called juxtaglomerular cells. The juxtaglomerular cells. That's also abbreviated JG cell. The juxtaglomerular cells are the cells that produce renin. Now, if you don't remember renin, it's one of the molecules produced by the kidney. I don't know if you remember EPO, erythropoietin, that's produced by the kidney. We talked about calcitriol. I have all of those names in this packet down at the bottom somewhere. Some of those compounds that the kidney makes to regulate physiology in the body. So it makes renin. Where does renin come from? It comes from these JG cells, right? Now, renin, when it's secreted by those JG cells into the blood, renin is what activates the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Remember, angiotensinogen is converted to angiotensin 1, which is then converted to angiotensin 2 in the lungs by the enzyme called angiotensin converting enzyme. So, Angiotensin II and aldosterone, which comes from the zona glomerulosa of the adrenal cortex, if you remember that. Angiotensin II and aldosterone in all of their effects raise your blood pressure in your body. So this is why, this is one reason why the kidneys involved in regulating your blood pressure. Besides regulating water volume, it releases renin that activates the most important hormonal regulator of blood pressure in the body, which is the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So those are the JG cells. And that's how you're going to tell the difference. If you don't see the connection point of the arteriole, you wouldn't be able to know if the blood's supposed to come in this way or if it's supposed to come in this way. The efferent arteriole does not have these JG cells on it, right? So afferent, efferent, arterioles. You have to identify them. The other thing we have here is a portion of the renal tubule. We have the most superior portion of the ascending nephron loop, the ascending limb of the loop of Henle, if you like to use the other word. Now, during development of the kidney, in the baby, in the fetus, in utero, the while the kidney is developing, the ascending portion of the nephron loop physically comes into contact with this afferent arteriole. And where the cells touch each other 
in both the renal tubule and in the afferent areole, the cells become specialized. In the wall of the J, in the wall of the afferent arteriole, we have JG cells. The part of the wall of the tube that touches the afferent arteriole in the renal tubule, those cells become specialized. They're called the macula densa. The macula densa has the job of monitoring 24 seven through your whole life. These cells monitor how much sodium chloride is passing through the tube at this point. So let me go to this picture real quick. Oh, let me just finish this first. Coming off of the renal corpuscle is the proximal convoluted tubule. Notice these are cuboidal cells in here. The majority of the cells that line the tube are cuboidal cells, but we do have histology changes down the length of the tube. We're not covering those changes. Uh, we're gonna focus on the cuboidal cells and the transporters in their membranes. But these are the cells that have the job of saying, hey, we just filtered out sugar. We better take the sugar from the filtrate and put it back in the blood. So they have the job of reabsorbing it, All right? And we're gonna talk more about that. <clears throat> but let's move on into this and I'll tell you more about the macula densa. We actually have two different types of nephrons in the kidney. You have the majority of the nephrons, about 85% of all of the nephrons in the kidney are the ones that look like this. They're called a cortical nephron. And the other one looks like this. It's called a juxtamedullary nephron. Now they look very similar. They all have the same parts. The main difference, two main differences between the cortical and the juxtamedullary nephron is the position of the renal corpuscle in the cortex, number one. In a cortical nephron, the nephron is pretty much housed up in the cortex. Its loop of Henle or nephron loop barely dips down into the medulla. So it's got a short nephron loop, right? But also its renal corpuscle sits higher up in the cortex. So we call it a cortical nephron. So since there's a million nephrons in each kidney and 85% of all of the nephrons are this type, that means you have about 850,000 of cortical nephrons in the kidney. You have about 150,000 of these because you have about 15% of these, 15 to 20%. Juxtamedullary nephrons. So why do we call it that? Well, look at this little line right here. That line is called the cortical medullary junction or line. And it's a de delineation point between the cortex up here and the medulla down here. But what it really represents is the very top of a renal pyramid. So this is the top of the renal pyramid, which makes these vessels that are arching over the top of a pyramid, the arcuate vessels, the arcuate artery, in the arcuate vein. Now, just medullary nephrons have a loop of Henle or a nephron loop that's very long and it dips almost all the way down to the tip of a pyramid at the renal papilla. So they have very long loops, nephron loops, all right? So let's get back to the macula densa for a second because we're about to get into glomerular filtration. And why it has to be regulated. We're not going to go through all the regulation mechanisms, but I am going to tell you why it needs to be regulated um, for this reason. So here is the arcuate artery. Blood's ultimately going to be coming up a renal column and interlobar artery, which sends the blood into the arcuate artery, which then sends the blood into the cortical radiate artery. Remember, I said that's the only one that radiates perpendicular up through the cortex and the only branch that comes off of the cortical radiate artery is the afferent arteriole right there so blood's going to go through the afferent arteriole into the glomerulus under high pressure we're going to filter 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 through the filtration membrane we're going to form our filtrate and the filtrate is going to flow in one direction down the length of the renal tube now Here's the kicker. What is the driving force that forces the filtrate fluid to move through this tube? 
I mean, there's no pump pumping the fluid through the tube. So what makes the filtrate flow through the tube, but just more filtration? So if, if I filter once, fluid goes here. I filter again, it pushes that fluid forward. If I filter again, it pushes that forward, so forth and so on. And so the rate at which we filter the blood is exactly what drives the speed of the filtrate through this tube. If we are filtering too quickly, boom, 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 boom. The filtrate is going to move through the tube faster than it should. And, it's not, and the cells that line the tube are not going to have enough time to reabsorb any good material substances back into the blood. And for that matter, they won't have enough time to secrete, have secretion of unwanted substances from the blood directly into the tube. I'm going to show you that in a second. So basically you're going to ultimately, you may lose good substances out in urine that you don't want to lose because your filtrate's moving too quickly. Now that typically does not happen in a healthy kidney because once the filtrate is moving too fast through this tube and the cells don't have enough time to reabsorb everything that they need to, including sodium chloride, by the time the filtrate reaches the most superior section of the ascending tube up here, the macula densa has the job of monitoring how concentrated that salt is in that fluid. And if there's too much salt in the fluid, the macula densa says, hey, the filtrate is moving too quickly through the tube. We need to slow down the filtrate flow rate. So how do we slow down the filtrate flow rate? You have to slow down filtration rate. And so the one of the two principal ways that we change filtration rate is by altering blood pressure in the glomerulus. So there is a feedback mechanism. The macula densa says, hey, there's too much salt in the filtrate. That means we have to slow down filtration rate. And so there's a feedback mechanism that will decrease blood pressure in the glomerulus and thus decrease filtration rate, which will start slowing down the filtrate flow rate. So that loop would run and run and run until the salt con sodium chloride concentration is back to where it's supposed to be. And the macula densa says, hey, everything's good. We want to keep it right here so we can go back doing what we're supposed to be doing. And the loop would shut off. So the blood pressure in the glomerulus constantly changes in order to change how fast we filter and ultimately to maintain a constant filtration rate. Sometimes it goes up a little bit and we got to bring it down. Sometimes it goes down a little bit and we got to bring it back up. So that's referred to as glomerular filtration rate. And we're going to get into that in one second. Before I move forward, I want to tell you this on the kidney model. On one side, they have a cortical nephron. I forget which side it's on. And on the other side, they have a juxtamedullary nephron. On the test, you're going to have to distinguish which one is which. So if they're pointing at, let's say, this tube right here, you would have to say PCT of cortical nephron. That would be the shortest way you could write it. Or you could just write it out, proximal convoluted tubule of the cortical nephron. See how long that is? So you could say, uh, or you could say cortical nephron PCT. That would be even shorter cortical nephron PCT, right? Or if they're pointing to one of the limbs of the loop, let's say they're pointing to this limb, you would say ascending cortical nephron loop. Or we would say descending cortical nephron loop. So that's a that's just a way I have I found that we can truncate the words to make it easier to write and you still describe exactly what you're identifying. So descending cortical nephron loop, ascending cortical nephron loop. 
Same thing in the juxtamedullary. You would say descending juxtamedullary nephron loop or ascending juxtamedullary nephron loop. And I forgot to tell you what juxtamedullary means. The prefix juxta right here means adjacent to. So in a juxtamedullary nephron, the renal corpuscle is adjacent to the cortical medullary junction. So we say juxtamedullary is next to the medulla. All right, let's look at the three processes that are involved in causing urine to be formed. It's not as simple as just filtering the blood. Three things have to happen in the kidney in order for urine to be formed, which is the waste excretory product. But by forming this excretory waste product, we have regulated all aspects of the blood because of this. The blood comes in the afferent areole to the glomerulus. It's under high pressure, so it forces fluids and solutes out. And like I said earlier, pretty much everything in the blood is filtered out except for Red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, and large plasma proteins stay behind in the blood. If you have blood and platelets and large proteins in your urine, that's abnormal. You have a breakdown of the filter membrane at the glomerulus. You might have what's called glomerulonephritis, inflammatory response in the kidney at the glomerulus. So ultimately, the blood is going to filter that filtrate out. And then, so we have good stuff in there, our sugars in there, some vitamins, our electrolytes, all sorts of things. But we also have waste products in there. So nitrogenous waste products, uh, lactate, uh, all sorts of, of things that are in there that we have to get rid of. So as the filtrate flows through this tube, the cells that line the tube, remember the majority of them are cuboidal cells, have transporters in their membrane that we're going to learn that will transport the wanted substances from the filtrate into the blood. That's called tubular reabsorption. So basically all the way down the length of the renal tubule, we have the ability to reabsorb substances from the filtrate back into the blood before the fluid leaves the tube. When the fluid leaves the tube into the minor calyx, it's called urine. While it's in the renal tubule, it's called filtrate. So that's one thing that we do. We have to reclaim all of our good stuff we filtered out, and that's called tubular reabsorption. But look what happens when the blood comes into the glomerulus. Yep, it comes in, and we're filtering, we're filtering. But while we're filtering, the blood is not just stop. It keeps moving out via the efferent arterial. So sometimes there's excess material substances or unwanted waste products that didn't get filtered out appropriately, and it flows into the efferent and then into the peritubular network in the cortex or the vasa recta in the medulla. So here's the peritubular network up here, all these capillaries up here. That's the peritubular network. Down here around the, the nephron loop is the vasa recta. So that's what's being represented by this vessel right here. So we have a second chance of taking any unwanted substances that pass the filter up and stick it back directly into the tube so we can get rid of it. That's called tubular secretion. So by the time our glomerular filtration is complete, tubular reabsorption and secretion are done and the, fil and the filtered fluid is at the end of the tube, it's got whatever's in that fluid is going to be lost in urine. We can't reclaim it anymore. All right. Now let's look at, um, that's the one I said I had twice. Let's look at glomerular filtration a little bit. So we're not going over the homeostatic mechanisms that are going to regulate GFR, but it is sufficient to know that GFR, which is glomerular filtration rate, GFR has to be maintained pretty precisely. We don't want it too high and you don't want it too low. So if it's too high, you're filtering too quickly, you're going to lose substances in urine that you don't want to. And you're not going to have enough time. Uh, you don't have enough time to reabsorb those substances. So you're going to lose them in urine. 
On the other hand, if you're filtering too slowly, the fluid moves too slow through the tube and you have too much time to reabsor reabsorb stuff. So you don't adequately excrete waste products. You're reabsorbing some waste products back into the blood. So for this reason, we want to be just right in between too high and too low. We want to, and it's about 125 mils per minute is, is how quick this filters uh, on average. So let's look at this formula. You have to know this formula for the physiology test. It's called the net filtration pressure formula. Um, if you covered that in lecture, chapter 21, there was a net filtration pressure formula. All capillary beds in the body are governed by four forces. But since this capillary bed is very, very specialized, we can narrow those four forces down to three. The primary force that drives filtration is the blood pressure in the glomerulus directly in these capillary loops, the blood pressure. And the blood pressure in the capillary loops has a weird name. Don't yell at me. I didn't make it up. It's called the glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure. Hydrostatic pressures are pressures from water pushing on something. That's what a hydrostatic pressure is. So the water in the blood is pushing on the inside of the blood vessel here, the capillary. And that is what is trying to force fluids and solutes out into the capsular space. And that blood pressure or the glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure is higher than any other capillary bed in the body. 55, milli, mil, 55 millimeters of mercury of pressure is high. On average at other capillary beds, um, it's about 36 millimeters of mercury of pressure at the arterial end and 16 millimeters of mercury of pressure at the, at the venule end. So this capillary is very special for having high pressure. And also, I forgot to tell you earlier, it's the only capillary bed in the body that has an arterial feed and an arterial drain. All the other capillary beds in the body have an arterial feed and a venule drain. All right, this one's different. So here's our main force. Now, to calculate if we're going to filter the blood or not, and that's what we're doing here. We're trying to calculate a number to see if we actually end up with filtration. And we would know if we end up filtering the blood if when we do the calculation, we end up with a positive number. If you end up with a positive number, you always filter. If you end up with a negative number, fluids and solutes are going back into the blood vessel. Well, that does not happen here under non-pathological and non-physiological states. So basically in a healthy kidney, fluids and solutes never, ever, ever go backwards into the glomerulus, ever. All right, now that's not to say that there can't be a problem some physiological or pathological problem with the kidney where the membrane can be uh, damaged. I'm not saying that, but we're not covering a pathological states of renal function. You have to take your pathophys class for that. But nonetheless, we have 55 mil millimeters of mercury of pressure. You're going to subtract from that all of the forces that try to push the fluid back in. And those forces include the capsular hydrostatic pressure because you're going to have a water building up out here. So it's going to have a back pressure back against the capillary. Well, that pressure is only 15 mil millimeters of mercury of pressure. Obviously 55 millimeters of mercury pressure is a, is a lot bigger, but we still have to subtract that. So we're going to take and subtract from 55. We're going to subtract 15 from it. And then we're going to subtract another force that tries to pull fluid in to the capillary. It's called the blood colloid osmotic pressure or the BCOP, the blood colloid osmotic pressure is 30. So when you do this simple calculation, 55 minus 15 minus 30, you end up with a positive 10. So we have to know this formula right here, right? So if you end up with a positive number and in a, in a healthy kidney, you always will, then we're always going to filter, okay? All right, the last thing that we have to cover throughout the, the last few slides of the PowerPoint are actually the transport mechanisms by which we can reabsorb or secrete substances to and from the blood and the filtrate. So in order to do that, we have to go through some definitions 
it's just some terms. The last time you probably heard of these things was ages ago in general biology. So ultimately we have active transport and passive transport, right? You probably remember those terms at least. But we also have something called secondary active transports. Let me define this for you. Primary active transporters are transporters in the membrane that use ATP directly in order to pump a substance across the membrane. So we always call these active transporters, these primary active transporters, we typically call them pumps. You may have learned the name ATP ACE because the pump technically is an ATP ACE, which is a generic name for any enzyme that can cleave ATP. So the sodium potassium pump is the pump that's always gonna be using ATP to make sure that the level of sodium on the inside of the cell always remains low. That'll make sense in a minute. Because the other transporters are gonna use the electrochemical gradient of sodium in order to move other substances to and from the blood in the filtrate. And those types of transporters that are gonna use the electrochemical gradient are basically the concentration gradient of, the, of sodium are referred to generically as symporters and antiporters. Symporters move two or more substances in the same direction. Sim means the same. Antiporters move two or more substances in opposite directions across the membrane. So here are the ones we're gonna learn that are located in the po proximal convoluted tubule. We have something called the sodium glucose symporter and the sodium hydrogen antiporter. So, and we also have water channels called aquaporins. We have aquaporin ones are in the proximal convoluted tubule. We also have aquaporin twos. They're located in the distal convoluted tubule and just into the collecting duct. But here's what the transporter does. This is our first symporter. It's in the proximal convoluted tubule. And I wanna specifically cover this one because one of the abnormalities that I think everybody's fairly familiar with, with urinalysis, is that you're not supposed to ever, ever, ever have sugar in your urine. I think everybody knows that. And so the reason for that is we're supposed to be able to reabsorb all of our glucose that we filter out in the proximal convoluted tubule. Because it's the proximal convoluted tubule cells out of the whole renal tubule only the proximal convoluted tubule have transporters to reabsorb glucose. So if the sugar level is too high in somebody's blood, like an uncontrolled diabetes mellitus, they're going to filter out too much sugar, glucose, in which case they're going to override the ability of the transporters to transport it because they can only move so much sugar at one time. So yeah, this one's gonna be moving into the blood, but there's one passing it up, going downstream. And so look at the nephron again, real quick. The only glucose transporters are in this proximal tube. So if we're filtering out way too much sugar into the filtrate, some of that glucose is gonna bypass the proximal tube. And as soon as it hits the loop of Henle, the nephron loop, if you will, it's going to end up in urine because there's no other glucose transporters along the length of this entire tube, none. And so that's why hyperglycemia, where it's at least 160 milligrams per deciliter or higher up to 200, is people are going to be urinating out some glucose and that's not good. But let me show you how this, the transporter works. This is called the sodium glucose symporter. It's going to allow sodium to move into the cell and pull glucose in with it. So since they move, so sodium always moves down its concentration gradient. And sodium's always going to want to move in because remember that pump, that active transporter is always pumping it back out. It's using ATP directly in order to maintain sodium low in the cell. So we end up with a one-way flow of sodium through the cell. So sodium always wants to come in and we can piggyback a ride in with sugar, some amino acids, some small vitamins. These transporters can move several different other substances as well. 
right? So that's our first importer. Here's where I talk about glucosuria. That's where your blood sugar is too high. Um, if it's over up to 200, that's way, way, way high. On average, it should be around 100. 80 to 120 really is okay, but it should be around 100. <clears throat> so if your blood sugar is real high and you can't absorb, reabsorb all your sugar, it's going to end up in your urine. And that term is called glucosuria. Happens in diabetes mellitus is one of the telltale signs of someone with uncontrolled diabetes mellitus, right? All right. Um, let's look at the other transporters and move forward so we can finish up. I know your brains are getting tired. So here they show the sugar one again, sodium glucose importer moving in the same direction, right? This is only found and the glucose transporter in the back. This is called the basal lateral membrane. These glute transporters in the back and these sodium glucose importers are only found in the proximal tube. Now we also have in the proximal tube the ability to, to excrete acid out into the filtrate via the removal of hydrogen ions. So we have what's called the sodium hydrogen antiporter. That's this, tr that's this transporter right here. Sodium will still always go in on its own because we have the sodium pump that uses the ATP. Notice the symporters never use the ATP directly. That's why it's called a secondary active transporter. It's using the energy from ATP secondarily. So the pump uses it first and then this, this one uses it after. So sodium comes in, and then at the same time, this transporter is transporting hydrogen back out. <clears throat> In this way, we have the ability to excrete acid and re basically remove acid from the blood. That can help bring their blood pH back up to normal. We're going to cover that next week. One of the principal reactions that we're going to cover is this carbonic acid cycle again. Oh, somebody has their hand raised. Hold on. Um, do you think you could like zoom in on the picture? Let's see if I can zoom in on the picture. Thanks for asking that question. I, I should be able to right here. Just so I can see because it's really small. Can you see it now? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. All right, very good. Hold on, let me get a drink of water. All right. <clears throat> so here is our sodium hydrogen antiporter. This carbonic acid cycle was covered in the respiratory chapter. It's also covered in your lecture if your lecture teacher does it. Um, but nonetheless, we're gonna recover this next week. But look what happens. You have CO2 and water everywhere. And CO2 is related to acid in the blood. It's like if you hold your breath, you actually induce respiratory acidosis because you build up carbon dioxide that then is converted to acid just like a carbonated drink feels acidic if you try to drink it too quickly. In the back of your throat, it burns because of this. Carbon dioxide combines with water in the presence of carbonic anhydrase, the enzyme that combines these two together, and it forms this acid. This is carbonic acid, H2CO3. H2CO3 breaks up into, or really ionizes down into what we called hydrogen ion. That's really the acid part. And it's what we call a conjugate acid and a conjugate base. And so we, we liberate hydrogen and bicarbonate. So hydrogen can be excreted out in urine or what will become urine and bicarbonate can be reabsorbed into the blood. So not only are you getting rid of acid by getting rid of CO2 and acid directly into urine, you make the urine more acidic you're also reabsorbing buffer. So we're gonna learn about bicarbonate a little bit more next week. Bicarbonate is a really important buffer in the fluids of our body. And it basically can absorb acid and raise our pH. That's why if you have a patient who is, has, has a, a very low pH, they either have metabolic acidosis or severe respiratory acidosis, where severe respiratory, where severe respiratory acidosis is a little bit more common especially if people have like COPDs or you have a, somebody hit their head, they're not breathing. Um, in order to correct their blood pH, a doctor would order you to hang a, an IV bag of sodium bicarbonate. Well, you're infiltrating sodium bicarbonate. The more bicarbonate you put in their blood, the more acid it can absorb and raise the pH back to normal. So the kidneys are doing that for us. 
basically we're reabsorbing buffer into the blood and we're excreting hydrogen out. Um, and I may pull this, this, these transport, these pictures up next week so we can revisit it uh, when we're dealing with how do we correct acid base imbalances. Now, this is not the only one that can transport hydrogen. It's just one. They're found in the proximal convoluted tubule, right? All right. Let's put this back where we can see this. All right, now we have two cell types that are in the distal tube and the, what's called the collecting duct. Um, I left this in here because I want us to know a little bit about aldosterone action. Remember I mentioned the renin angiotensin aldosterone system? Well, aldosterone's target is the kidney. Aldosterone is gonna be released really because of two stimulations. One of them is angiotensin II would stimulate it to be released from the adrenal cortex. And then if you have high potassium in your blood, if you have hyperkalemia, then aldosterone would be released into the, into the blood from the adrenal cortex. Uh, because what aldosterone does is aldosterone affects principal cells to incorporate transporters to reabsorb more sodium into the blood. So if we have more transporters that move sodium into the blood, we can help increase our blood pressure. And the reason for that is this statement. Wherever sodium goes, water is sure to follow. So indirectly, aldosterone makes your kidneys reabsorb more water. It does that by causing you to reabsorb more sodium. But on the other hand, it also causes more potassium to be kicked out in urine. Our kidneys are set up to always lose a little bit more potassium and save a little bit more sodium. That's just the way our kidneys are set up. And the reason why that's good is because, and we don't want to have ion imbalances in the blood ever. I'm not suggesting that. But in people that have high, high potassium in their blood, they could have a severe heart attack very quickly. Hyperkalemia can stop the heart, make the heart go into se severe arrhythmias. And the most severe arrhythmia, as some of you may know, is ventricular fibrillation. All right, so those are the cells that respond to aldosterone. Now, the last cell type and the last transporter that we're gonna look at are the intercalated cells. And the intercalated cells are very important because these are the cells that truly manipulate blood pH by increasing the excretion of hydrogen in urine and increasing the bicarbonate reabsorption into the blood or vice versa. And I'll give you a, an example. I don't want to get too heavy into it because this is next week's lab, but Let's say we were very, very, very acidic. Our blood pH is below normal. Do you guys remember your blood pH range? Anybody? 7.35 to 7.45. Very good. 7.35 to 7.45, right? Now, let's say we were at around 7.3. That's very, very acidic. Very, very acidic. And when we are outside of either end of that pH range, we're Told, we're so not healthy, it's not funny. So many bad things can happen. Um, so we have to regulate our blood pH within that very small range. So if we're very acidic, this cell will start to excrete even more and more and more and more and more hydrogen, which is acid, into urine. That means that our urine is going to become more acidic because we're removing the acid from the blood. And on the other hand, we're also reabsorbing more and more and more buffer bicarbonate back to the blood, which will also buffer the acid and raise our blood pH back to normal. So in times when our blood pH is very low, we want our urine to be acidic. In times when our blood pH is too high and we're alkaline, we don't want to lose our acid in urine. Because if we get rid of acid from the blood, if we're already too basic, that's going to make your blood pH even more basic, higher. So you don't want that. 
So in extreme alkalosis, which is a very, very high pH above 7.45, this cell can do something very amazing. It could actually reverse the movements that you're looking at here. Instead of getting rid of acid to urine, we can cause acid to be reabsorbed into the blood. And instead of reabsorbing bicarbonate, we can actually remove bicarbonate from the blood and excrete it out in urine. So you know what the pH of the urine would be? If you're reabsorbing more buffer out here, the pH of the urine would be higher. So depending on the blood pH and the actions of these cells, it changes the pH of our urine. And for that reason, urine pH range is actually really high. And I'm about to show you what that is in a second. But the very last slide that I have on here for you, you don't have to worry about, this is for, this down here is really for lecture. You don't have to worry about the phosphate down here. Um, we're gonna deal with phosphates uh, next week as buffers. Um, I, I did leave this in here, it's typically for lecture, but you need to know what these hormones are. At, at least you have to know what their effects are, right? But I would review it anyway, it's gonna help you with lecture. And it's a pretty good table comes out of your chapter in your book. All right, let me stop sharing that screen and go to our lab manual. We only have two things left. I know it's hard, just bear with me. And then I'll field any questions that you may have. So let me pull up this. All right, does everybody see our Canvas site? Yes. Yes. You said yes? Yeah. yeah. All right, very good. That means you can see the engaged lab manual, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, <clears throat> you need to read through the, it's only like two pages. You need to read through these paragraphs in here. I'm not going to go through everything that's in here. I talked about that stuff in the PowerPoint. But there are, oh, I'm glad I saw this real quick. Under the functions here, I forgot to mention this one. The functions of the kidney are kind of out here. We went over that. Um, gluconeogenesis. If you don't remember that word, that's the production of a new sugar. Um, your kidneys have the ability to, do, to make a little bit of sugar for us if we need it. Just like your liver. Your liver does it a little bit more, but your kidneys can perform that process as well. So I forgot to mention that in that PowerPoint. The rest of these little paragraphs go over the gross anatomy of the kidney, you know, what it's made of, goes over the parts of a nephron, what those parts do, goes over glomerular filtration rate with the net filtration pressure that we already covered, right? <clears throat> Tubular reabsorption and secretion, talks about the semporters and the antiporters in here. And it covers some of the, the hormones that you're going to see in that PowerPoint, all right? Now, and they talk about secretion of hydrogen and the reabsorption of bicarbonate, which I just covered with the intercalated cells in uh, the collecting duct. The next part of the chapter is where the names are for the parts that you're going to be identifying on the models. And I just want to scroll down to get to this. So if you, if you turn the pages to more toward the back of chapter nine, you get to where it has the urinalysis information. So you need to study a few things out of here. That's why I wanted to point it out. Number one, you need to know these normal electrolytes, these solutes that are in, that's supposed to be in urine. And it goes from highest concentration or most common to the least common or the least concentrated. But these are all substances that are supposed to be excreted out in our urine, right? We're about to learn a few things that are not supposed to be excreted out in our urine. Under the characteristics of normal urine, the only one I'm interested in, you can read through it. I mean, you, you guys should know some of these uh, uh, basic characteristics of urine anyway, in, in case you ever have to, you know, deal with urinalysis. You know, what is the color? Is it dark? In, case, in which case there might be some bad metabolites in there. Somebody might have blood in the urine and stuff like that. Colors can change. It's supposed to be clear to yellowy. I mean, everybody knows that. It's supposed to have a slight aromatic 
odor to it. It's not supposed to be strong and it's not supposed to be fruity or smell like acetone. I'll explain this in a second, dealing with diabetic individuals. So, um, and ultimately the specific gravity is a little bit higher. It's got all these uh, uh, than distilled water, uh, but it's, it has all the solutes in it. I'm not really worried about the specific gravity or any of these. What I'm worried about for this year analysis lab that we, I'm about to show you is the pH range. The pH range of the urine is 4.5 to 8. So it's a fairly large pH range. And remember, I just said, depending on what the pH of our, our blood is, we would want the opposite to happen for urine. So if our blood was acidic, we want to remove the acid from the blood and put it in urine. That would make the urine acidic and vice versa. So that's why we have this large pH range. The average is somewhere around six, just above, just below, right? But anywhere in here would still be considered normal. Now, the next section talks about the abnormalities. You've heard of kidney stones before, read through it. I want you to read through this paragraph. Learn about pyelonephritis, uh, uh, inflammatory response in the kidney, right? Um, a couple of these I definitely want to focus on because it's in the urinalysis thing. Glucose. 160, really above there, you're, you're maxing out how much sugar those transporters can reabsorb. If someone's blood sugar is 160 or high, just higher than that or a little higher, they're going to lose some glucose in urine, which is totally abnormal. You're not supposed to have any glucose in your urine. So above 160 milligrams per deciliter, those transporters are maxed out. They can't absorb faster than that. So that happens in, in uncontrolled diabetes mellitus where someone has hyperglycemia. That's 160 or higher. Um, now, when sugar ends up in the urine, it's called glucosuria, which is a term I mentioned earlier. Albumin is a large plasma protein. If albumin ends up in your urine, which is abnormal, um, which, but it can under certain types of conditions that can be corrected. When albumin ends up in your urine, it's called albuminuria, all right? Albuminuria. This is an indicator that the filtration membrane at the glomerulus is failing. So people, depending on the problem and if it can be corrected, are basically having renal failure at the level of the glomerulus, right? It also can have consequences on the transport processes in the proximal convoluted tubule, which can affect the outcome of substances, other substances ending up in urine. So here they have what's called physiologic and pathologic albuminuria. Physiologic conditions like people who overeat excessive, 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 excessive protein intake. I'm not talking, oh, I had three protein bars today, you know, and I had a protein shake this morning. I'm talking about there are some people that totally just consume nothing but protein all day long. Protein, when it's broken down, ultimately causes for the reabsorption of itself. So it starts to put more pressure on the filtration membrane and albumin can leak out into the capsular space. Um, Processed during, uh, sometimes during pregnancy, more protein can end up in the urine. But ultimately after pregnancy, that's typically corrected. Um, extreme physical activity where your muscle tissue is breaking down and releasing protein into the blood. So basically anything that causes a very high protein level in the blood may cause physiologic albuminuria. The pathologic one happens because of... Uh, renal trauma, damage to the kidney in some way. It can be a physical trauma, like down here you see somebody punches or gets kicked in the kidney. It can be due to overuse of antibiotics for various types of uh, infections. And some types of antibiotics can start harming the kidney. Autoimmune 
uh, attack to the kidney. Um, hypertension. That's the, the main one I wanted to talk about. Renal hypertension. Hypertension in our body can cause damage to the outer cortex, uh, the, well, the renal cortex, where the filtration membranes are located. All of those renal corpuscles are located in the cortex and they start to become damaged. And so in that way, we're going to start losing a lot of stuff in urine and your urine, the characteristics of urine will drastically change. And that's typically one of the first signs that people see changes in their color of their urine and the smell of their urine. And then they go to the doctor, oh, you're in stage one of renal hypertension or stage two, whatever. So damage to the renal corpuscle because of high blood pressure, right? Now, the next one that we're going to worry about, so we're going to deal with glucose on a urinalysis. We're going to deal with, we're going to call it protein, not just albumin, but protein in the urine. Um, ketones. I got to tell you what ketones are. We're going to deal with those. And then we're going to deal with pH. The rest of them we're not really going to get into. Well, I think we do the leukocytes and blood. Uh, I'll pull it up in a second. But ketones are not supposed to be in your urine at all, right? If ketones are in your urine, that means that somebody has uncontrolled diabetes mellitus or they are in severe or extreme ketosis voluntarily. And I'll explain that. Um, I don't know if you know much about diabetes, but people with diabetes uh, mellitus, like diabetes one, they have to take the insulin shot. Some people can control their diabetes by diet, but the diabetes where you have to take your insulin shot. If those individuals are not taking their medicine correctly or they're not taking it at all, and I don't know if you know anybody that has it. They typically are, are fairly thin individuals. They're, they don't typically gain too much weight because they're constantly in a hyperglycemic state because their cells cannot use glucose because there's no insulin. So what does your body turn to for a fuel source to make ATP? Fat. Their body burns adip fat out of the adipose triglycerides out of the adipose tissue constantly that's the same thing that happens when people get on the keto diet i'm sure you heard of that big slang term over the last couple of years basically a keto diet is a low carb diet don't eat sugar and you'll lose weight diet right well <clears throat> they're not all that healthy if you're not doing them correctly and you're on them for a long 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 period of time when you don't eat any sugar, or if you're a person with diabetes that cannot use sugar, both of those mean the same thing. If the cells cannot use the sugar, the body will start burning the triglycerides, which is the fat in adipose tissue. So what I mean by burning it? Well, they start to break down the fat, fatty acids. When fatty acids are broken down, ketone bodies are released. There's three principal ketone bodies. Now these can be used in to make ATP aerobically, but they go directly to the mitochondria. It's, it, it's not my goal to go back over aerobic respiration, but ketones go directly into the mitochondria. They bypass glycolysis. So here's the kicker. The enzyme systems in the mitochondria have a maximal rate that they can use the ketones to make ATP. So what if the cells are being supplied with too many ketones that they can't use? They would back up into the blood. Let me give you a simple example. If I gave you a ton of money every single day and it was more money than you can spend, it would back up into your checking account I mean, that would be a good one, right? But you get the point. If we are producing more ketones than our cells can use to make ATP, they back up into the blood. The three main ketone bodies are acetoacetic acid, acetone, I know you heard of that, and beta-hydroxybutyric acid. I know it's some weird names, but these are the three basic ketone bodies. Now, 
when a diabetic has uncontrolled diabetes, they could go into an acidosis state. In particular, we're going to learn next week, it's metabolic acidosis. It's what we call keto acidosis. And people try to get into an acidic state because when you're in that acidic state, you're in what's called ketosis. You can't stay in that state for very long because your pH is low. Your body's going to start to correct it, but you have to start eating correctly or the diabetic has to start taking their medicine. So why does blood pH become more acidic if ketone bodies are in the blood? Well, look at the name. Beta hydroxybutyric acid. Acido, acetic, acid. These things are acidic. So if you have all these acidic compounds building up in your blood, you're going to become acidic. And that's what we call ketoacidosis. Now in uncontrolled diabetes mellitus, uh, you know, in severe cases, I don't know if you know it, but it, some diabetics, when it's in that severe case, they can go into what's called a diabetic coma. I don't know if you ever heard of that. That's because their blood pH is so low that you can actually dip down into a, a, a comatized state, which is very, very severe, and you could die from it, all right? In fact, one of my cousins a long, 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 long time ago never took care of himself. I was in college with him, and he, he didn't make it, and he lived by himself, and yeah, he when they're in that state, they can't move. So at any rate, um, if you smell the breath of a diabetic, that's in ketoacidosis, their breath smells fruity. Why? Because these ketone bodies actually have a fruity smell to them or a sweet smell <clears throat> to them. Like if you ever go smell acetone, even though it smells like a chemical, it's, it's not a pungent dull odor. It's kind of like this arom aromatic chemical sweet smell to it. These acetoacetic acid and beta hydroxybutyric acid even smell sweeter, right? So in diabetics, you're gonna have sugar entering the urine. You're gonna have ketone bodies entering the urine. There's too much in the blood and their blood pH is gonna be low. We, I think we actually deal with a diabetic in one of the case studies next week. Um, all right, but let me move forward so I can show you this assignment. Um, I want you to read through the pH range. It talks about acidic and basic pH, sort of what I was mentioning earlier. Um, you're not supposed to have red blood cells in your urine. If you do, that's called hematuria. That's a pathological problem with damage to the glomerulus. Same thing with hemoglobin. You're not supposed to have that in the urine. That's called hemoglobinuria. Um, you can read through the bile and the various pigments. You're not supposed to have white blood cells in the urine. I think that's the other one we're going to look at, leukocytes. All right, so when you read down through those, and those are all of the abnormalities, you're going to get to this urinalysis lab exercise. <clears throat> the first page um, is just a, if we were in lab, we would learn how to do a dipstick, a urinalysis. A dipstick is a chemical strip that has chemical pads on it. You dip it into a sample of someone's urine, and then you wait for the little chemical pads to change a color. <clears throat> You then compare the color of those chemical pads onto the picture of, the, it's usually on the bottle or a little graphic that comes with the kit. And you can see what the ranges are supposed to be. And it's all based on a color range, right? Now, the first one that we would normally do, I would give you an, an, a control group that was supposed to represent normal urine. We would dip the little dipstick in there. We would wait a few minutes couple of minutes. Sometimes it happens immediately within seconds. I think one of the tests took about a minute in order to have the color change. But nonetheless, you would sit there and wait until the colors change. And then you compare it to the colorations on the chart. And in a control urine, which is supposed to be a normal urine, our pH would be normal. So we would write normal pH. You don't even have to write the number. We would just write normal pH because the strips that we use are not that sophisticated in the lab, in our lab. So you would just write normal pH. And for protein, you would write negative normal because you would see 
no protein in it. So that's a negative test for it, which is normal. You wouldn't see glucose. So you would say negative, normal. You wouldn't see ketones in there. So you would say negative and normal. That's how you would write this out. So if you scroll down, we have our first case study right here. 82 year old woman has arthritis, goes to the doctor, the, you know, the emergency room and uh, she overconsumed aspirin. And aspirin is an acidic compound, acetyl, uh, uh, sa, sa, sorry, acetyl salicylic acid. A little tongue twister there. Acetyl salicylic acid is an acid. So if you overconsume that, it's going to make your blood pH go down. You're putting more acid in your blood. So for that urinalysis, we should expect to see a lower pH than normal, right? So what I'm about to show you is I'm going to pull up the assignment because what we did as a department is we digitized this case study, right? And we made it into an assignment, but it looks kind of strange. So I wanted to show you at least the first one and what it looks like. And now this assignment <clears throat> is in exercise nine. At the bottom, it says your analysis, phys physiology activity. It's worth 20 points. And as long as you do it, whether you have all the correct answers or you're incorrect, everybody's going to get their 20 points. So I'm going to pull it up and show you what the pictures look like here. Whoops, I didn't want to do that. Let me go back. I wanted to preview it. All right, so here's the, the first page. This would be the normal. So basically this is those pages out of your engage manual. This is what, this is where the strip is gonna be. This is your little, your analysis strip for your patients would be on this side. This is the normal color because this is the chart that you're comparing. You're going to compare this color to that color, this color to that color, but only for these. We're only doing the pH. We're doing, and, and then they're going to write the pH number in for you. You can see the color, but on these simple ones, the pH range, it doesn't go below five. So what if somebody was had very acidic pH? We wouldn't be able to see exactly what the number is. You see this little orange right here, which is normal right here, same color, has a pH of five right there or something. Well, in the case studies, they went ahead and wrote in what they want the pH to be. If it, and you can see here, 6.2 would be normal, right? So you would write in here, pH, normal. You don't have to write the number, you would just write normal. If it's not normal, you would write below normal or above normal. That's what you need to do. So what is the normal range of pH for, for urine? 4.5 to 8. Okay. Or you could write below normal acidic, above normal basic or alkaline. But we have to know when it's acidic or it's basic. Then you look up here for protein. And on here, you see protein right there, PRO. You see the color of it right there. Same color as a normal right here. And so in your, in your little chart at the bottom, you would say, okay, that's normal. So you would write down here, negative normal, negative slash normal, something like that, or just write negative or normal. You're not writing a number. And that's what's confusing. You look at the color. Oh, well, there's a number here. I can't really see it. Oh, there's a number there. I can't really make it out. I'm, we're not, I'm not worried about the number. I'm worried about if the value for the solute is normal or abnormal. Is it high or low or normal? So for this is the control group. And you can look at each of them. For glucose, there's the glucose one, right? Then for blood, you look up there for blood and then leukocytes up there. And for the normal, I mean, for the control, you're just, they're pretty much all normal. When you look at all of the colors here, see the blood right there, normal color. So this is the normal negative. And then here is where it's abnormal. You're high or low in these colors, all right? Or below this, which we don't see below this color. <clears throat> now, I'll just, we'll just look at this one real quick. And then I'm going to let you try to do these on your own. And if you have questions, 
about it, you can email me or we just field the questions next week for lab anyway. Some of this is gonna be related to our acid base balance anyway. But let's look at this lady, this, this lady with arthritis that overconsumed aspirin, acetyl salicylic acid. <clears throat> you put too much of that in your, in your body, your blood pH is gonna drop. So really the first thing I would really go to look at is the pH one. Yep, look how orange that is. It's oranger than this. You see above this color going up, it doesn't get orange, it gets more yellowy to green to blue. So this is the basic end. This is real alkaline over here and it becomes acidic by getting or more orange. So this is a, a hotter orange in that color. So I know this orange is below five. Well, since I can't tell exactly what the number is, they went ahead and put the number for you right here. So the pH, when they did a urinalysis on this lady, her pH of her urine was 3.8. Is that normal or abnormal? Abnormal. Well, you were right here, abnormal acidic or abnormal low. Then you would go up there and read the one, the color for protein, the one for glucose. See, the glucose is normal, ketones, but, and just write normal. You, were, you would write normal or abnormal. And you could write high or low, but nonetheless, it's always high because for these, because you're not supposed to have any protein, large protein. You can, have, you can have trace amounts of protein, but not large ones. Um, you can't have any glucose, no ketones, no blood, and no leukocytes, all right? So you just write abnormal. So does everybody kind of understand me now? Yes. And you see there's a couple yeah. of questions. You can go and research that and see if you can answer them. And here's the next case study in the Engage Manual. 76-year-old guy, he goes to the clinic. He's got uh, cardiovascular disease, hypertension and cardiovascular disease. How would that affect his urinalysis, right? So I want you to try and figure that out. All right, now 